of it. And you haven't seen your room yet. She replied, you know, loving my room does not depend on how the furniture is arranged. It depends on how my mind is arranged. If you think about it critically, she's legally blind. She can't even see. She has already decided she wants to be happy. You see, regrettably, it's estimated up to 92.7% of all media in the so-called free world, a society like Kenya, is negative in nature. So most of our lives are full of doom and gloom. Have you ever had someone say, look, I married this woman, I gave her the 10 prime years of my life to make me happy, she couldn't, she just doesn't have it. She couldn't make me happy. She's an ordeal. I'm looking for a new deal. <laughs> no one can make you happy. For that matter, no one can make you unhappy. You can only empower someone else to make you unhappy. Happiness cannot come to you. Happiness can only come from you. For the singles in our midst, please understand your own self-rejection turns people away. When you're happy, when you have a jovial spirit, you begin to attract people towards you. What you call beauty is very subjective. We all see different things. A each one of you is wonderfully and fearfully made. What you need to have is a jovial spirit that attracts others. The marriage in our midst realize that when you're happy, you release oxytocin. The hormone responsible for body that keeps you through your low times, your conflict moments, is kept through that. There are many ways of dealing with it. But number one, you need to engage in physical activities together. Joke together. Play tennis together or squash. Or even skipping a rope. It doesn't have to be an expensive job. But for sure, physical activities activate endorphins, the feel-good hormones, which are a great trigger to oxytocin. I didn't want to say this, but you can also release oxytocin by getting a good kiss from a dear one. I don't say such things. Do I ever say such things? No. 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 Don't try it in the hall. <laughs> Happiness helps your body to fight enemies and aliens in your blood system like bacteria and fungi. It enhances your immune system. No wonder many studies suggest a direct correlation between happiness and life longevity. Some people even suggest every moment you laugh, you increase your life by a certain duration. Happy people are able to be more innovative with solving their own problems as they arise. The more you're not happy, the more your mind is blocked to innovative solutions. Now, besides doing physical activities together, you see, if you were to ask me three things to make you happy, of course, number one, it is your attitude. You choose to be happy. Number two, engage in physical activities together. Get out of your laptop. Switch off your phones and TVs and tablets. Do some physical stuff together. It activates, as I said, endorphins. But number three, I will tell you another way of ensuring you start your day strong. Change your passwords. Doc, what did you say? Yes, change your passwords. You heard me right. You see, we live in a generation where most of you log into your laptop four or five or more times a day. Just imagine if in that laptop you wrote the words, I choose to be happy today as your password. And you're going in there four times. And you keep seeing the words, be happy. Or you can even make it very personal. Be happy, Jim, if your name is Jim. If you're offended by Anne, have your password, I forgive you, Anne. <laughs> then after six months, change it. I choose to be happy today. If King David of ancient Israel was listening to us today, he could come here and confirm exactly what I'm saying. He will tell you, I have written the password on my laptop. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. You know, there are two great apostles in the Bible. There are many, but there are two great ones. One was commissioned to the Gentiles, and one was commissioned to the Jews. Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, he wrote a letter to a church he founded at Philippi. In the fourth chapter and the fourth verse, he says, most of you know it, say it together, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. What most of you do not know is this. He wrote that letter from chains, from prison. 
If you can afford to tell people to rejoice when you're in jail, then the apostle to the Jews is known as Peter. I read a story in Acts 12. At some point, they wanted to execute him. Think about this. They had 16 soldiers around him, four schools or four soldiers each. And then where he went to sleep, he slept between two soldiers, and he had no clothes. I know he has no clothes because when the angel came, the first thing he told him is to dress up. <laughs> what I have never understood, by the way, he was scheduled for execution the following morning. What I have never understood, how many here can sleep when they know they are dying tomorrow morning? The guy was snoring so much, when the angel came, he had to slap him for him to wake up. Get up, Peter! And all the soldiers, the following day, were executed by order of king. He's called King who? Start with the letter H, Herod. King Herod. They were all executed because of releasing Peter. He was scheduled for execution, and he was sound asleep. This makes me suggest there is a peace that transcends human understanding. I pray that becomes your portion tonight. Thank you. Let's go to number three. What is the third pillar? Motivation. Are you there? From an aerodynamics perspective, the bumblebee cannot fly. His body is too heavy. His wings are too light. His wingspan is too small. But you see, ladies and gentlemen, the bumblebee does not read books on aerodynamics. The bumblebee simply flies. You've got to be careful with the so-called expert advice. A lot of people advise you from what has already been done. God called you to find out what you could do. Because what you are meant to do has never been done. All limitations are self-imposed. There was a marine biologist who decided to put a shark in a large holding water tank. And then she brought in some bait fish in the tank. As you would naturally expect, the shark swam very fast, attacked and ate all the bait fish. Then she inserted a partition of transparent, clear, but very strong fiberglass, dividing that tank into two partitions. Then she brought some more bait fish. As you'd as you expect, the shark decided to swim again and attack them, but this time round, he slammed into the fiberglass, hurt himself so badly, bounced off, and deterred. He tried the second time, and the third attempt, and the fourth attempt. But eventually, an hour into the experiment, he gave up. That experiment was repeated a couple of times every day for several weeks until finally the shark stopped attacking the bait fish. She finally removed the fiber glass partition. And although this time around there was no partition between the the shark and the bait fish, he never attacked the bait fish anymore. Mark this, the physical barrier was already removed. But something worse happened. A permanent mental barrier was inserted in the mind. And a lot of us, when we try something once or twice and fail, even when it is within sight, just like the shark being able to see the bait fish because this was a transparent glass, we hit the glass once and we bounce off and never try again. Let me tell you this, brothers and sisters. There's not a single success story that did not hit that fiberglass. I know very few of you know the story of Sensual 101. And it's a story I've never told anyone. The only person who knows is Mercy. I tell you the truth. We tried several times to start Sensual 101, invested a lot. Let me just share one of them. The year 2009, I decided to host a meeting. I advertised it all the year to it, the whole year. I decided to launch this club first as a teen club for teenagers. I had a huge asset in the sense that I was known in very many schools in those days. And I thought of looking for a school where the girls would come because we started with the girls. So I went to the Kenya High School. 
I got the facility. The Lord blessed that lady, the chief principal, Rosemary Saina. I experimented with five schools, Pagani Girls, Moy Girls, Nairobi, State House Girls, Limuru Girls, and the whole school, Kenya High School. The idea was students after Form 4 to come for the conference, and that's how we wanted to start, with the life skills before they go to the university. I wanted to make that intervention. Now, the students knew me. They had had me on several occasions, most of them since Form 1. The teachers knew me. The parents knew me. We planned for a conference of 500 students. You can imagine my shock. Only eight of them turned up. <laughs> eight of them. Only eight of them. Guess what I did? I went to Madame Saina and I said, look, this facility is expensive. I had chosen a good location, Kileleshwa. There was hot shower. The place was tranquil. The fee was very friendly, 5,000 the whole week, and I'm giving them food and training. So I told me, Saina, look, I may not afford this facility because I had planned for 500 students, there are only eight. So what do you want to do? She asked me, I said, look, I'll take all the girls to my house. So I called all the parents. Fortunately, the parents knew me. I don't know how on earth they slept in our house the whole week. Marcel will tell us. <laughs> because I know our house is not a palace yet. I don't know how they slept. And graciously, one of them is a very active member of Sensual Non Life Club. She has stayed with us to this very day. Later on, she went to the university, did her degree in actuarial science, did her master's degree. When she was doing her master's degree, by coincidence, I was her official supervisor. And she's with us today. Angela Mokami, are you here? So after the meeting, yeah, you could appreciate her. <laughs> now, after the meeting, you can ask Angela how they were sleeping in my house. <laughs> Eight high school girls. I had two Shaba boys. I had two children. <laughs> And there was a house guard in the house. So I don't know. I think let's appreciate Marcy for you. <laughs> I don't know how she cooked for them because I didn't bother. You know, there are times you decide to hear from God and go away <laughs> until the lesson time. <laughs> but even though they stayed in my house, there are some bills we still had to pay to the school. And it was not an easy thing. I repeated again the following year. And let me tell you this. I, I say, look, I say, it's good I share a part of this story. Because some of you, again, Ajara was among them, came again when I was launching. Now not in like Regency, but in Clarion Hotel. And I know a few of you came. Again, it didn't pick. When we went to Grand Regency, the current like Regency, I decided to take a risk and pay for six months nonstop over my dead body. This thing must work. I think the Lord has laid in my heart a message for Kenya and for the world. And finally, you guys responded. Yeah. <laughs> See, you like watching from a distance. <laughs> Is this guy really serious? That's how you came here. Amen. Amen. <laughs> now, there are many things I can talk about motivation. This is one of my pet subjects. Let me just say three ways of staying motivated. Are you with me? And, and I think it's good sometimes for us to share our failures and setbacks and defeats, lest you think, Dr. Kenyaji, one day, you know some of you came on Friday last week, but one to KICC. KICC people told me that was the largest meeting since the year began. And some of you might be thinking, I just woke up one morning and Nairobi was attracted to what you were doing. That's not anywhere near the story. And I'm saying this primarily to tell you, keep on trying, keep on trying. Don't give up. Focus. Keep hitting that fiber glass until it gives way. Does that make sense? Yes. To stay motivated, let me just tell you three things. Number one, pursue meaningful goals. Pursue meaningful goals. A farmer had a dog that used to sit by the roadside waiting for the next car that would come around. And once a cow would come around, he would chase him back in trying to overtake him. A neighbor asked the farmer, do you think your dog will ever catch up with any of the cars? The farmer said, that's not what bothers me. What really bothers me is what he will do if he catches one. <laughs> Peter Drucker says, there's nothing so useless as doing something efficiently that should not be done at all. It is not good, it's not enough to be busy. So are the ants. The question is, you're busy doing what? And that is why 
if you follow me for some time, my biggest emphasis, I may say, is family. Number two is discovering purpose. And I've already taught six seasons on purpose. Two for men only, two for women only, two for mixed gender. And one of them we did here in Nairobi, one of them we did in Egypt. And if you have not gone through this, I want to tell you this. The beginning of fulfillment in this life, which is a bigger variable than even success, is when you link who you are with what you do. When what you do is what you love, and what you love is what you do. You wake up every morning just doing what you love doing. That's what I was doing this morning in a certain organization. That's what I'm doing right here. And I keep telling you this, the only reason we are going to end 8 o'clock is because of your time. If you are able to stay here until midnight, I'll continue. Because this is my breath. This is my oxygen. I urge you to find your place. If you have not connected with your purpose in life, if you have not gone through this program, get some testimonials around. There are many people here who have gone through it. And let me request them, please, please, kindly, if you have gone through that program, 12 hours of transformation or seven same women of all, all purpose-driven men, all what we did at the River Nile in pursuit of purpose, all these groups combined. Please, could you lift up your hand? Keep, keep lifting. I'll tell you why I'm saying this. I want those people, just watch those guys, ask them, get a testimony from them, find out whether there was any difference after they attended the program and sign up for February next year. We are only going to do it twice next year here in Nairobi. The next one we are going to do it in Singapore in April. And, and since we have already closed the doors for the Singapore cruise, where we are cruising from Singapore to Kuala Lumpur, if you still want to do, I have another cruise that I'll be doing in August at the Mediterranean. You can join our team from the UK. We'll be doing the same subject on purpose, now at a higher level. So get to know who you are. Be directional. Don't confuse motion with meaning. Don't confuse activities with progress. Don't confuse processes with results. Don't confuse stories with deliverables. I don't just read. I read so much. I read every day, but I read in a directional manner. There's nothing else I read the whole month of September except emotional intelligence. That's what purpose does to you. And I guarantee you, between now and the next meeting you come here, I'll be reading only one subject. Only one subject. The power of the spoken word. Why? I'm not guessing. I know what I want to cover 14 months from today. It is clear in my mind. Crystal clear. And, and I, I, I get amazed at how many organizations buy what I teach you people. Last week I had to deal with three. I feel pain when I see people walk, walking without direction. You see, you have, if your interest is business, you have the same number of hours as Manu Chadaria or Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg. If your interest is in ministry, you have the same number of hours as Bishop Jakes or Joel Austin or John Hagee. If your interest is in sports, you have the same number of hours as David Rudisha. If your interest is in music, you have the same number of hours as Churchill. The difference you have with them, these guys are directional. They are clear with your purpose every single day. They are on to that purpose. You've got to have that purpose if you're going to make impact. Don't be like that dog chasing a meaningless goal. To stay motivated, <clears throat> say no to naysayers. A group of frogs were walking in the woods someday when two of them accidentally fell in a deep pit. The frogs up there began to discourage them, gave up. The pit is too deep. Save yourself the trouble, fall and die. But they could hear none of it. They kept on trying and trying. The more the frogs shouted up there, the harder these two tried. Finally, one of them had came to the voice, gave up, fell and died. But one of them kept on trying, and the louder they shouted, gave up, save yourself the pain, sleep and die. The harder it tried, and harder and harder and harder. Finally, it managed to get out. And then they asked him, you didn't hear us. How come you kept on jumping? And using sign language, he said, you know, I am deaf. And all along, I thought you are cheering me up. <laughs> Winston Churchill said, if you've got to stop at every point along the way, 
to throw stones at every barking dog, you'll never reach your destination. I add, if you'll always be distracted by small voices, you'll never do anything significant. If your enemy cannot destroy you, he will focus on distracting you. Feed your focus and you've got to starve your destruction to death. You are too important to give in to distractions. To stay motivated, number three, take care of your time. Take care of your time. Imagine there was a bank. Every morning credited your account with 86,400 shillings. Every night, wrote as write off. Every single cent you never made use of. Didn't allow overdrafts, didn't allow any balances, anything to be carried forward. Burned the records of the day and every single morning opened a new account. Indeed, you have such a bank. The name of the bank is time. Every morning, it accredits your account with 86,400 seconds. Every evening, it writes off as unused, as lost in a single minute. You never made use into good purpose. Doesn't allow any overdraft, overdrawns, carry forwards. You can't create time or destroy time. You can't control time or tame time. You can't draw against time or turn back the hands of time. You can't have extra time or lack time. You can't lose time or gain time. You can't have less time or more time. You can't make up for time lost or recover time you did not make use of. You can't reverse time or build time reserves. You can't speed up time or slow down time. You can't stop time or manipulate time. There's only one thing you can do with time. Make use of time. Look at me, every one of you. Time has no emotions. We can't come here tonight and teach time emotional intelligence. Time has no emotions. Time doesn't care the emotion you're going through. They can be very extreme emotions. The most extreme, burial or wedding. Time doesn't care. Time moves on. If you don't plant during the sowing season, you'll be embarrassed during the harvest season. Time will not wait for you to recollect who you are and correct yourself. Time, and even the subset of time, seasons, have no emotions. Somewhere I read, as long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest time. Genesis 8, 22. Time and chance happens to them all. Ecclesiastes 9, 11. We are all given time and chance. We may not be given equal chance, but all of us are given an opportunity to make a difference. The opportunities might not be uniform, but all of us are given that opportunity, and all of us are given that time. How much are you growing against this bank? If you make the most of every second you have, you can outlive yourself, you can outlive time, you can transcend time through the impact of the people you influenced. There are minutes I listen to recordings of people who died long ago, Martin Luther King Jr., R. W. Shabak. They are still influencing me today, long after they are gone. You can outlive yourself, transcend your time on earth by making the most of your time here on now. This takes me to the fourth pillar of emotional intelligence. Are we learning something? Yes. Empathy. <clears throat> a 12-year-old boy wanted to buy a puppy when he stumbled across the shop with a huge billboard, puppies for sale, but then he realized they were going for $50 and he only had $3. Nonetheless, he decided to get into the shop. Then he noticed a lagging, limping puppy and he told the shop owner, I want that one. The shopkeeper said, no, you can't buy this one, you'll always limp. 
He'll always be late. He said, no, no, no. He insisted, this is the puppy I want. The owner said, if you really want this lame puppy, I'm going to give you him for free. No, this puppy is worth every bit like any other puppy. All I'm asking of you is to give me terms. I only have $3. Allow me to bring $3 every single month until I settle the full amount. Then he stood down and unfolded the pant leg of his left leg, exposing a twisted, crippled leg that was supported by a big metal brace and then softly told the shopkeeper, that puppy needs empathy. I can't run to, and he may need someone who understands him as well. We need to teach our own children empathy. I honestly believe with every fiber of my being, if every human being was empathetic, there'll be no poverty, no corruption. There'll be no crime. There'll be no evil on this planet. Every evil prevails because we are selfish by nature. If it's in your interest to help me, we build an empathetic generation. Then we've got to instill it early along in our children. Find out from your kids how they feel about others. Ask them what makes people behave the way they do. You see, you can draw useful lessons from fictional characters of movies or books they like, their favorite movies or books. Teach them to give back to the community. Be deliberate about it. I've got some good news for you. If you honestly do not have a place where these children can learn what I'm telling you, bring them to Sense 101 Junior Club. They meet the second Saturday of every month at Nairobi Club, Upper Hill. So they'll be meeting this coming Saturday. Now, one of these Saturdays, we're going to teach these children how to give back to the community. We will teach them how to feed the hungry. They will make the sandwiches themselves. They will look for the ingredients themselves without the help of the teacher. They will make the decoration bags, the gift bags and then deliver the gifts to the hungry in the society. It is these small or seemingly small actions with a common sense of purpose that kids do together that help them to get along with one another and become empathetic with the needs in the society. We will allow them to make some mistakes. Some mistakes are okay, so long as they're not like threatening. They only need to understand they will have to bear the outcome of the consequences. If their gift bag looks funny, they have to deliver the funny bag but to develop skills by allowing them to make some of these mistakes. I urge you today, sometimes, when you grapple through life's tricky seasons, give your children a peek behind the curtains. Many times children believe that all adults have their act put together. They think we are demigods. You may need one time to expose yourself and let them. You stepped out of work earlier today because you're emotionally down and you intend to overcome it through cooking, or taking a walk, or going for working out. But let them realize it's not magic and your grumpy feelings just disappear. It's a process that you're deliberate and conscious about. You only need to be careful you don't do this so frequently until you allow your children to participate in your own emotional ups and downs. <laughs> a class teacher was marking the compositions of her children elementary school children. When she marked the last composition, as the husband was just playing around with his smartphone, she bitterly broke down. When he realized the wife was sobbing, he came over to her, honey, what's going on? She said, you know, I was marking compositions of my kids. When I came across the last composition, that touched me too much. What was the composition all about? I asked the kids to write, my wish. So, what did the boy write? I wish I was a cell phone. Within a single ring, it's picked. My dad is always playing with it in the evening, but can't find a minute to play with me. Okay, okay, who wrote this? Our son. <laughs> People need empathy, not sympathy. Sympathy is feeling for feeling sorry for. Empathy is feeling with, feeling with another human being. Empathy is being aware of the feeling of another person from their own perspective. 
Empathy is listening to the verbal and the non-verbal voice, including gestures, body movement, facial expressions, the physical display of emotions, using questions to probe whether you truly understood the feelings of the other person, asking for feedback to clarify whether you truly understood, respecting and acknowledging their feelings even if you disagree with them, refraining from demeaning or making comments or suggestions that are judgmental or belittling to the feelings of the other person. See, we hoot along the roads because we don't see from the perspective of the other person. We talk at each other as spouses because we don't feel the other person. And empathy has to do with feeling the other person. There's a no old American Indian proverb that says, never criticize a man until you've walked for a mile in his moccasins. Steve Cannon, the CEO USA Mercedes-Benz, commissioned a survey in the year 2012 just to find out how many of his employees were using, or rather were driving, the Benz. They found out over 70% of the employees had never driven a Mercedes-Benz at all. So he decided to spend some $4 million in a program he called Driving a Star Home. And he literally bought all the frontline employees Mercedes-Benz. When he was being interviewed by the media, why he did that, he said, we've got to move from customer satisfaction to customer experience. My employees cannot adequately serve my customers unless they experience them. Think about that. The greatest message ever spoken on empathy is the golden rule. Do unto others as you would they do unto you. Asking yourself, how would I feel if my spouse was cheating on me? Realizing you don't outsmart them. They are just more empathetic. In a strict sense, they are wiser than